My old flame, Marlena Dietrich, singing Falling in Love Again. As I listen, I feel that they're really referring to my window, to Freud. Every time they come up on the repeating tape, I find them almost unbearably poignant, with all their talk of clandestine love, erotic fixation, and painfully hidden romantic agenda. But they might also just as easily be referring to this time of year, with the aching sadness and loneliness that seems to imbue everything. Where is that perfect object, that old flame, that secret love that eludes us? Unfindable, unpurchasable. And if the winds blow, I know I'm not to blame. This is my final weekend as Christmas Freud, and I'm starting to feel bereft in anticipation of having to take down my shingle. I started off as a monkey on display and have wound up uncomfortably caught between joking and deadly serious, a persona that seems laughable at times, faded for me at others. I know this will pass, but for now, I want nothing more than to continue to sit in my chair, someone on the couch, and to ask them with real concern, so tell me, how's everything? David Rakoff, the version of this story is in his book, Fraud. His latest book is called Half Empty. Christmas Fraud, Christmas Fraud, it's Christmas Fraud. In the window, interrogate, interrogate, sublimate, sublimate, soon it will be Christmas Day. City sidewalks, busy sidewalks, all neurosis and fear, children act out the air. Then there's your dream, Dad's a drag queen. Mom is driving a train. Some cigars are only cigars. Ah. Christmas Freud, Christmas Freud, Christmas Freud, Christmas Freud. See Christmas Freud in the window, in the window. Close your eyes, close your eyes, analyze, analyze, I'm afraid our time is now up. You know, I think we have time for one more, yeah? Where's Jaren's at? See what it says on the box there. It says Dad. Poor Daddy. Poor oh, good boy. Daddy was a good boy. He got something. It's 1966. John's family taped everything, all the time, he says, including this Christmas when he was three. Huh? Wow, Lee! What are you doing in there? Let's get together. Look at that! 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 Look from his vast and strange record collection. And on this, the third Christmas of his life, he's given exactly the present that he asked for. A close and play record player. This is forget to buy. John's mother pulls out her camera to take a picture of him with his presents. You like it? John with his first photograph. Okay, baby. Wow, pretty. Boy, I'm the ball don't work. Dirty batteries in there? I just put no batteries in there. What the heck? You'll be spitting on them. You'll have lead poisoning yet. Ah. Uh, uh, it deteriorates from there. Oh, I'm disgusted with these cameras. I should have got one nice one from Santa Claus. Uh, that's what I should have got. This right here? 
This is what Christmas is all about. Everybody's posed, everybody's ready, everybody's straining to be happy. And everybody has this picture in their heads of the perfect Christmas. And, of course, it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to live up to that picture. And so, disappointment is built into the very structure of the day. And so the best you can hope for on Christmas, and I say this is a Jew, <laughs> somebody who has never celebrated the holiday, which makes me an outside observer, an impartial observer, the best you can do is to ride the imperfections. Hope they don't ever take everybody. In this tape from 1966, John's parents spent a lot of time trying to keep him from destroying a new train set the very first day he gets it. Halfway down, halfway! Three-year-old John runs the train so fast, it always crashes. Oh, don't turn it so fast, Jan. <laughs> Jan, don't monkey with that. Oh. You know All day long, the perfect day wavers in and out of focus. For a while, wobbling towards disaster, broken toys, hurt feelings, disappointment. Then, listening back towards happiness. My three-year-old DJ puts a 45 of Winchester Cathedral in his new record player and runs the trains as fast as he can. Well, Greg, Miss Peter Spay by Peter Connolly and myself with Elise Spiegel and Nancy Updike. Christmas Freud Caroling by the formerly known as family, Bill O'Reilly, Kate O'Reilly, Colm O'Reilly, and Jenny Magnus. A program note, we here at the Staff of This American Life have guest edited a section of the New York Times Magazine that appears uh, this weekend. If you're curious, get a copy of the paper or look for it online at nytimes.com slash magazine. This American Life is distributed by Public Radio International. Support for This American Life comes from reputation.com with tools designed to help individuals and businesses protect and improve their online reputations. Or more about managing online reputations and protecting personal information at reputation.com. And by Amazon.com, makers of the Kindle Touch 3G e-reader, now featuring a touchscreen interface and 3G wireless connectivity. Books can be downloaded from anywhere a cell phone works. The full Kindle family can be explored at Amazon.com. And by Scion, Scion, making vehicles for today's connected youth and offering more than 150 accessories to choose from to fit any lifestyle. Learn more at Scion.com. Scion, what moves you? WB Easy Management Oversight by our boss, Troy Valentino, who warns you, Freud will be back soon. Stop deceiving yourselves. I'm Eric Glass, back next week with more stories of this American life. You have another chance to hear This American Life tonight at 10. Coming up next, it's Hanukkah Lights, and at 2 this afternoon, Hungry for the Holidays. Julia Child takes us back in time, presenting two stories, A Christmas Carol, read by actor Peter Donat, and I was really very hungry, written and performed by her old friend, MFK Fisher. That's at 2 this afternoon, Hungry for the Holidays. If you're looking for an end-of-the-year tax write-off, it's not too late to donate your used car to KQED, vehicle donation program. It can all be handled in time for this year's taxes. KQED will arrange a convenient time to pick up your donation. Find out more at kqed.org cars. It's a spare the air day. We want to keep the air clean for Santa tonight. Clear skies tonight and chilly with temperatures in the mostly the 30s and 40s and uh, tomorrow's sunny. You're listening to KQED FM San Francisco, KQEI FM North Highland, Sacramento. One o'clock. Support for NPR comes from NPR member stations and from the Gruber Family Foundation to help extend the depth of international coverage of the world's most significant issues. Welcome to the 2011 edition of Hanukkah Lights, readings for the holiday season with Susan Stamper and Murray Holmes. 
On this year's show, four stories written especially for Hanukkah lights, we'll hear Nona Maccabeus by Gloria Davidis Kirchheimer, Ethics of the Fathers by Tamar Yellen, First Day by Elisa Albert, and Fidelis by Erica Dreyfus. All on Hanukkah lights for 2011 from NPR. Nona Maccabeus by Gloria Davidis Kirchheimer. Someone had the bright idea that the residents of the Coney Island Sephardic home would enjoy some entertainment on the first night of Hanukkah. The social director was ecstatic. She wore her wig as though it were a crown of office. My grandmother laughed at her behind her back. No sabe nada. She doesn't know anything, she said to me when I came for my weekly visit. But Nona, I said, she went to school. She knows all about working in a place like this. Mrs. Steinberg's PhD meant nothing to my grandmother. Nona, who was never taught to read as a girl in Izmir, Turkey, was proud of my grandfather, a lay rabbi, because he knew how to read. And so do I, Nona. She took her hand and put it on my stomach. Reading can make a woman crazy, she said. All you need to read are the signs and wonders. They will tell you to be fruitful and multiply. I, your grandfather was the light of my eyes, la luz de mis ojos. We were speaking in Ladino, the medieval Spanish we carried with us from Spain after the Inquisition and into the Ottoman Empire. Nona had taught me many proverbs and songs. She was humming one now as she rocked on the veranda. The Coney Island Sephardic home faced the boardwalk and the parachute jump. It was a warm day for December, and the smell of cotton candy wafted over us. I held Nona's hand as she urged me to breathe. Our respirations were interrupted by the arrival of Mrs. Steinberg, or doctor, as she preferred to be called. She smiled at me and said to Nona, a Shana Madel. Dr. Steinberg had not yet caught on to the fact that the majority of the residents of the home were Sephardic, and not Ashkenazi like her, and could not understand Yiddish. Spanish, yes, Greek, Arabic, Turkish, French, Armenian, certainly. Nona wagged her finger at the woman and quoted a proverb in Ladino to the effect that a closed mouth will keep out flies. Thanks, sweetie, the social director said to my 90-year-old grandmother. You be good now. <laughs> they call her doctor, Nona said scornfully. Where is her white jacket? I knew that my grandmother had no faith in doctors, white jackets notwithstanding, and relied on a string of garlic tied around her waist to ward off the evil eye. How she managed to procure enough garlic for the purpose was a mystery. She did hint that she was on excellent terms with the Hispanic kitchen workers who would have had no difficulty understanding her. Seeing Nona slipping into a doze, I caught up with the social director. I heard I said that there will be some entertainment next week for Hanukkah. Dr. Steinberg clasped her hands in devotion. The granddaughter of the president of the board of directors had offered to bring her little group of musicians to perform. They would do so at no charge. I asked if she had met them or perhaps heard a tape. Steinberg's hand flew to her mouth in horror. Oh, I couldn't do that, she said. It would be an insult to Mr. Bensignor, the head of the board. I understood her position. The home was dependent on rich donors, and he was number one. But why have entertainment at all, I asked. Everyone likes a Hanukkah party, she said defensively. When I was a child, we had what we called a Hanukkah bush, and the kids got a present for each of the eight days. For a moment, I was retroactively envious. As a Sephardic little girl, I had to be content with only one present for the holiday. Also, Dr. Steinberg continued, we can have a repeat of what happened last year. The previous social director had presided over last year's Hanukkah and was fired immediately afterward. What happened was this. On the first night, each resident brought a menorah to the lounge. These were set on a long table, and one by one, they were lit by their owners. Just as the last candle was lit, one resident, Mr. Matalon, seized his menorah a handsome, weighty, silver object that had been in his family for generations and refused to leave it with the others. Following the letter of the law, he was going to take it to his room and set it in a window so it could be seen by passers-by. 
We have those mesh curtains in every room. You can't imagine, said Dr. Steinberg. A wrestling match ensued, during which two attendants were summoned to pry the elderly man's hands from his heirloom. In the course of the struggle, the menorah fell down and ignited the corner of the tablecloth. I could see why she would want to erase the memory of last year's event with some entertainment. When I arrived at the home a week later, along with other relatives, for the first night of Hanukkah, there didn't seem to be any evidence of an incipient conflagration. Mr. Matalon, last year's firebrand, had rejoined his ancestors. People were already beginning to step up to the large table where all the candelabra had been set, each with a name tag to avoid controversy. Every resident was invited to light a candle on his or her own menorah with the assistance of an aide or a relative. Nona's hand was surprisingly steady, and she brushed me away when I offered to help. Dr. Steinberg kept glancing at the door to the lounge. We were the entertainers. Was she going to have to come up with an alternative to what had been scheduled? When do we eat, the aristocratic Mr. Abravanel said, banging on the ground with his cane. Quick, Nona whispered to me. Give me the lokmas you brought me before he steals them. She started to pat me down, looking for this culinary treat, the Sephardic equivalent of latkes. Fortunately, at that moment, the door burst open, and a troop of young people came hurrying in laughing. The musicians, at last. And here is what the elderly residents saw. A couple of young women with bare midriffs, despite the December weather. One of them sporting a twinkling belly button and tattoos up her arms, the other wearing a nose ring. Then there was a boy with one earring and a shaved head, wearing tight black leather. Another had dreadlocks, while the remaining boys, or maybe they were girls, were wearing scruffy sneakers and t-shirts. One of them had a large black hat on, the kind worn by some Hasidim. They carried a motley range of instruments. With an agonized smile, Dr. Steinberg introduced the leader, Don Bensignor who began by saying, like, this is so not us, being late and all, but the van. She trailed off. The audience was getting restless. There was a lot of murmuring. A woman called out in Ladino, que vergüenza, shame on you. OK, guys, Dawn said, here's our hip hop Hanukkah. Sound blasted out of the electric guitar while a bongo kept the beat. There was actually an oud, an ancient Middle Eastern instrument, making noises never anticipated by the shepherds of Anatolia. The music seemed to be a cross between Israeli rock and Times Square subway music, particularly the kind you hear when you switch from the number one train to the BMT. I have expected the writhing of one of the musicians to turn into a breakdance. The audience applauded politely at the end of each number, but some of the women were tittering. I noticed that my grandmother had disappeared, but her cane was under her chair, which meant she intended to return. Now what about a sing-along, Miss Bensignor suggested. Just then my grandmother appeared in the doorway, resplendent in a white silk outfit shot with gold and silver filigree. There were tassels at her wrists and at the hem of the garment. A fringe of gold coins hung from a silk cap over her forehead. In her hand, she held a tambourine. She raised it high and gave it a shake. The band whooped with delight. Everyone started clapping and shouting as though awakened from a stupor. In a quavering voice, Nona began singing a Hanukkah song in Ladino that I remembered from my childhood. And this time, everyone joined in. Later while helping Nona out of her costume, which must have been over 100 years old. I congratulated her on her performance. I did it for your grandfather of blessed memory. He was the light of my eyes, she said again to me. The light of the candles reminds me of him. She folded up the silk costume carefully, the vest, the balloon pants, the sash, the open caftan with its exquisite embroidery. Now it's yours, she said. But Nona, I said, maybe next year. She shook her head. I kissed her and promised to come back soon. Though she didn't realize it, my grandmother had penetrated the significance of Hanukkah. 
Aside from the consecrated oil, the candles that burned for eight days, Hanukkah was the victory of the Jews against their Hellenistic Syrian oppressors. In her own way, Nona was the spiritual descendant of the Maccabees who didn't give in to an alien culture. She was not going to be taken over, not by the Ashkenazim who controlled her daily activities, nor by the current youth culture. I think of her victory every time I light the candles. Ethics of the Fathers by Tamar Yellen. It was the first night of Hanukkah and the first snowfall of the year across the north of England. By four o'clock, it was already dark. The big electric menorah over the entrance to the Rolinsky Hebrew School threw a cheerful amber light onto the snow as the children arrived for the last class of the term. Tonight, there were to be games, songs, and prizes for the best students, and every child was to go home with a bag of Hanukkah treats, a tin menorah, a packet of sweets, and a box of nuts and raisins. That was the night Mr. Bialik failed to arrive to teach the third class, 12 and 13 year olds. The children of the third class waited, in a manner of speaking. They snapped on the lights, they closed the classroom door, they took possession. Against the large windows, a clear reflection of their own bright dancing selves was thrown. Beyond it, lay the muffled darkness of the deepening snow. After 10 minutes of initial caution, Daniel Rifkin swept the blackboard and began chalking up rude words in large, fragile letters. The girls drew artistic tributes to their latest heartthrobs. Someone started a paper fight, and Gary Cantor and David Greenblatt dashed off to do unspeakable things in the boys' cloakroom. Anthony kept his place. With his gateway to the Mishnah open before him and his pencils at the ready, he sat more quietly even than usual, as though stilled by the surrounding uproar. But beneath the desk, his fingers trembled with suppressed excitement, for calamity was in the air. Something terrible was about to happen. A boy would fall from the desk on which he was climbing and break his neck, the door would open and a death would be announced. As the minute hand touched a quarter past, Anthony reached into his school bag and brought out his math homework. He wrote the date and underlined it, but he could not concentrate on the algebra problem. His eye wandered to the scuffed and torn first page of his gateway to the Mishnah with its ornamented titles. A ball of paper skimmed across his desk. He ignored it. He placed his shaking hands on his knees and waited. Not so much for his own sake as for the sake of their consciences, his parents had enrolled Anthony in religious classes at the age of nine. There, as if to establish the gulf between his sacred and secular selves, he was given the Hebrew name El Hanan, meaning God is grace. The entrance hall of the Berlinski School had a large blue star of David in its patterned floor and smelt of cleaning fluid from the neighboring bathrooms. Anthony attended every evening, Monday to Thursday, and on Sunday mornings from 10 o'clock till 12. For the first two years, he came under the strict but kindly tutelage of Mrs. Berg, who opened the mysteries of the alphabet, told stories, and was liberal with her Sunday prizes. From Mrs. Berg's, he was promoted to the third class, with its dark desks and triple blackboard covered in declensions of the verb to kill, which, being entirely regular, was a favorite paradigm. Here the students recited from battered Pentateuchs, the miracle of the Red Sea, the dream of the seven fat cows and the seven thin ones, and the death of Moses, all in the same soft monotone and beneath Mr. Bialik's watchful stare. He was a tall, stooping man with the face of an aged frog, a black coat, and the faded silk skullcap of the truly religious. His teaching methods were simple and severe. He believed in the virtues of copying, reciting, and learning by heart. To be taught by Mr. Bialik was to discover a true terror of ignorance. Our mitzvah boys who were put through their paces by him emerged with a new maturity, no longer boys, but young men. 
They studied Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy, avoided the legal passages, and progressed only to judges and kings. The prophets were beyond them. Gideon wrung the dew from his fleece. Samson died with the Philistines. The verb to kill remained as foolproof in the 17th year as it had been in the first. And each year at Hanukkah, they learned the familiar story which they had already heard a hundred times before, of how the Maccabees resisted the Greek influences which were so powerful and so popular, stood up for their Jewish traditions, and purified the temple. Anthony was not popular with his classmates, who saw him as a nerd and a teacher's pet. They never called him by his secular name, but always referred to him mockingly as Elhanan. All the same, Anthony enjoyed studying with Mr. Bialik, and for Mr. Bialik, Anthony was his prized pupil. He often repeated a phrase they had read in the Ethics of the Fathers, sit in the dust at your master's feet and drink in his words with relish. Anthony drank in Mr. Bialik's words with relish. Now, on the first night of Hanukkah, Mr. Bialik was an unprecedented 20 minutes late. He was not here to remind them how the apikorsim, the unbelievers, had turned to the ways of the Greeks and forgotten God, or to ask them to imagine how much courage it must have taken to stick up for one's principles and join the tiny band of Maccabees. Frankly, none of the children could imagine it. Chaos reigned, but the degree of noise in the third classroom had not yet penetrated to the office at the far end of the corridor. The blackboard was a sacrilegious.